Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm gonna to be doing a review of Andrei Sapkowski's Season of Storms. Dane reads. So this is the final Witcher book, at least at the point of uh, filming. He might have released a new one by the time you're watching, who knows. Uh, so obviously, you're probably not gonna to wanna to read this unless you've read the others, because you kinda of wanna read them in order. But uh, I'm gonna read the blurb here, gonna go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Gerald. The Witcher, whose mission is to protect ordinary people from monsters. A mutant who has the task of killing other unnatural beings. He uses magical signs, potions, and the pride of every Witcher. Two swords, steel and silver. But what would happen if Geralt lost his weapons? Caught in a spider web of political intrigue, hired to do a job he really doesn't want to do, and left weakened by his own mistakes, Geralt might finally have met his match. So yes, let's go through and check out some tabby tabs. So here, this is quite interesting because obviously this is a fantasy novel, but um, it's got like a debate around the ethics of abortion in it, which isn't what you'd normally think of, you know? So uh, Coral raised her hand and ostentatiously examined her fingernails. It was meant to signal that she couldn't give a shit about Bellahone's proviso. The king didn't decode the signal, or if he did, he concealed it skillfully. It has reached our ears, he puffed angrily, that the Honourable Madame Nade makes magical concoctions available to women folk who don't want children, and helps those who are already pregnant to abort the fetus. We, here in Karak, consider such a practice immoral. What a woman has a natural right to, replied Coral dryly, cannot, ipso facto, be immoral. A woman, the king straightened up his skinny frame on the throne, has the right to expect only two gifts from a man, a child in the summer and thin bass slippers in the winter. Both the former and the latter gifts are intended to keep the woman at home, since the home is the proper place for a woman, ascribed to her by nature. A woman with a swollen belly and offspring clinging to her frock will not stray from the home and no foolish ideas will occur to her, which guarantees her man peace of mind. A man with peace of mind can labour hard for the purpose of increasing the wealth and prosperity of his king. Neither do any foolish ideas occur to a man confident of his marriage while toiling by the sweat of his brow and with his nose to the grindstone. But if someone tells a woman she can have a child when she wants and when she doesn't she mustn't, and when to cap it all off offers a method and passes her a physic, then, honourable lady, then the social order begins to totter. I think we know that it doesn't. And a great quote from Coriolanus here, William Shakespeare, What is the city but the people? And here a quote from Dandelion in his half a century of poetry, his like fictional memoir he's writing. Guard against disappointments because appearances can deceive. Things that are really as they seem are rare, and a woman is never as she seems. And this is cool, uh, this is, gives you some information on like the magic systems in this world. The theft of your weapons took place around 10 days ago. An aeromancy is the best and most certain way of interpreting and analyzing past events, even very distant ones, but the rare talent of dream reading, which I don't possess, is necessary for that. Sort of ledge or cleromancy won't really help us. Likewise, pyromancy and aromancy, which are more effective in the case of foretelling people's fates, on condition that one has something belonging to those people. Hair, fingernails, a fragment of clothing or something similar. They can't be used with objects, in our case swords. And so all that remains to us is divination. Litta brushed a red lock from her forehead. That, as you probably know, lets one see and predict future events. The elements will assist us, for a truly stormy season is set in. We shall combine divination with seronoscopy. Come closer, grasp my hand and don't release it. Lean over and look into the water, but don't touch it under any circumstances. Concentrate. Think about your swords. Think hard about them. And we get this, and I think this is cool because Terry Pratchett had a sword made out of meteorite. He made it when uh, the Queen knighted him, and he was like, well, a knight needs a sword. Steel melted from a meteorite, and also blades forged from such steel, contains a great deal of such elements. It's magical. The entire sword is magical. Quad erat demonstrandum. Do you understand? Certainly. So, forget it, because it's poppycock. What? Poppycock. Fabrication. You don't find meteorites under every bush. More than half the swords used by witches were made from steel from magnetic ores. I used them myself. They're as good as the ones that fell from the sky when it comes to the side rights penetrating the elements. There's absolutely no difference. But keep it to yourself, Dandelion, please. Don't tell anyone. What? I'm to stay silent. You can't demand that. What's the point of knowing something if you can't show off the knowledge? Please. I'd prefer to be thought of as a supernatural creature armed with a supernatural weapon. They hire me to be that and pay me to be that. Normality, meanwhile, is the same as banality, and banality is cheap. And we actually get a sample, a uh, rough draft never officially published from half a century of poetry. And so we get this, and I just thought this is cool because it's uh, reference to Roach as well, which is a very cool character, the horse. As usual, Roach snorted and protested on seeing the blanket, and fear and protest could be heard in her snorting. She didn't like it when the witcher covered her head. She liked even less what occurred right after it was covered. Geralt wasn't in the least surprised at the mare, because he didn't like it either. Naturally, it didn't behoove him to snort or splutter, but it didn't stop him from expressing his disapproval in another form. Your aversion to teleportation is truly surprising, said Harlan Sara, showing his astonishment for the umpteenth time. The Witcher didn't join in the discussion. Zara hadn't expected him to. 
and uh, hear a quote about anxiety from Gerald, which is an anxiety disorder sufferer I can, you know, feel hard. Anxiety is never irrational, Gerald thought to himself. Aside from psychological disturbances, it was one of the first things novice witches were taught. It's good to feel fear. If you don't feel fear, it means there's something to be feared, so be vigilant. Fear doesn't have to be overcome, just don't yield to it, and you can learn from it. And again, another thing about portals here, um, teleportals, they're dangerous things. The worst portal failure Gerald had witnessed, which had forever discouraged him from teleportation, had occurred at the beginning of his Witcher career. At that time, a fashion for being transported from place to place had prevailed among the nouveau riche, wealthy lordlings and gilded youth, and some sorcerers offered such entertainment for astronomical sums. One day, the Witcher happened to have been there. A teleportation enthusiast had appeared in a portal bisected precisely down the middle. He looked like an open double base case. Then everything flopped out of him and poured down. Fascination with teleportals dis decreased perceptibly after that incident. And uh, a little bit, another interesting bit about like the magic here in this world and uh, some of the monsters. It's impossible to recover a child kidnapped by the Aguara, explained Geralt calmly. Absolutely impossible. And it's not even that the child won't be found owing to the fact that the she-foxes lead extremely secretive lives. It's not even that the Aguara won't let you take the child away. And it's not an opponent to be trifled with in a fight, either in vulpine or human form. The point is that a kidnapped child ceases to be a child. Changes occur in little girls abducted by she-foxes. They metamorphosize and become she-foxes themselves. Aguaras don't reproduce. They maintain the species by abducting and transforming elven children. And I enjoyed this at, a, at, a, at an auction house. I'm just going to read it to you and you can figure out what it is yourself. Lot number three, an ivory device of a mm, curved and elongated shape. Mm, probably used for massage. Foreign provenance, age unknown. Starting price 100 crowns. To my left, 150. 200, the lady in the mask with number 43. 250, the lady in the veil with number 8. Do I hear 300? 300 to the wife of Apothecary Vorstenkrantz. 350, going for the last time. Sold for 350 crowns to the lady with number 43. And here we get a quote by Pierre de Ronsard. He says, A mon retour, hey, je m'en désespère, tu m'as reçu d'un baiser tu glass. Tu glace, sorry. Which means, on my return, hey, I disappeared myself. You receive from me an icy cold kiss, or a kiss all ice. Kiss of all ice. And, uh, is a little quote from Dandelion. I'm just going to read the paragraph before it as well because it gives a little bit of uh, clarity because this is at the start of a scene. Dandelion impressed with his intelligence by stating something so obvious that Geralt was still unable to completely adjust himself to it or completely accept it. It's the end, isn't it? Gone with the wind. Of course she and the sorcerers needed you and you've done the job, now you can go. And know what? I'm glad it's happening now. You had to finish that bizarre affair sometime, and the longer it went on, the more dangerous the consequences were potentially becoming. If you want to know my opinion, you should also be glad it's over and that it went so smoothly. You should then dress your countenance in a joyful smile, not a saturnine and gloomy grimace, which, believe me, doesn't suit you at all. With it, you look quite simply like a man with a serious hangover, who to cap it all has got food poisoning and doesn't remember when he broke a tooth and on what, or how he got the semen stains on his britches. We've all had nights like that. And another bit I like here, uh, this old lady character is great. The old woman took a canteen from her bundle, scooped out a handful of green ointment, smeared it thickly on a piece of folded linen and applied it to the wound. Knit bone, guessed Gerald. A poultice of knit bone, arnica and marigold. Good nana, very good. Goat weed and oat bark would also come in use. Ark at him, interrupted the old woman without raising her head from the constable's leg. Trying to teach me herbalism. I was healing people with herbs when you were still puking your porridge over your wet nurse, laddie. And you, lummoxes, away with you for you're blocking out the light. And you stink dreadfully. You ought to change your foot wraps from time to time. Out with you, hear me? And uh, this guy basically is possibly going to lose his leg. And Jarrett's like, it's better to lose your leg than your life. And the man's like, nah, mate, nah. And uh, this is a nice little reference to Tolkien. He pushed the door, it didn't budge, but the witch's amulet quivered slightly. The door was magical, protected by a spell. The weak vibration of the medallion suggested, however, that it wasn't a powerful spell. He brought his face close to the door. Friend. The door opened noiselessly on oiled hinges. As he had accurately guessed, it had been equipped with standard weak magical protection and a basic password, as no one, fortunately for him, had felt like installing anything more sophisticated. It was intended to separate the castle from the cave complex and deter any creatures incapable of using even simple magic. And finally here at the start of chapter 20. So Dandelion, uh, Dandelion sighed and spurred on the gelding. He looked back and sighed again. He was a poet so he could sigh as much as he liked. Amen to that. So yeah, Season of Storms by Andrei Sapkowski. Probably a 4 out of 5. I like the fact that by this point all of the politics are well established. So it feels as though the plots can progress a little quicker because you're not having to be taught as much about the world. You kind of already know plenty about it by this point. Obviously if you've read the Witcher series up to this point, you're going to want to keep going. I gave this one a 4 out of 5. 
So there we have it, that's what I made of Season of Storms by Andre Sapkowski. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot.